Hello, this video is about how our lighting has changed throughout the years. I've been making videos professionally for about 10 years now, and during that time, I've learned a lot. Epic Light Media has learned a lot, and the way we light things has completely changed. So, in this video, I'm going to take you through the very beginning of my lighting experience to where we are today. And I hope that when you watch this video, you'll be able to see maybe where you are on this timeline. Maybe you know more about lighting than we do. Maybe you're using very different gear and techniques than we are. I've learned that the techniques that we're using really aren't as important as the final image. It's really all about how an image looks. Real cinematographers out there making real movies use very different techniques to achieve pretty similar lighting. It's not really about the gear, but it kind of is too. Being a filmmaker is a great collaboration between the artistic abilities and the technical abilities. And lighting is a perfect collaboration of both. So let's start at the very beginning. The first light that I ever bought a long time ago. It was from Home Depot and it looked like this. Ta-da! <laughs> this is a cam light. They're very inexpensive. When I first bought this light, I didn't put it on an expensive C-stand. I didn't even know what a C-stand was, but it's here today on this. Let's plug it in and see what it looks like. When I first started lighting, I didn't realize that lighting could shape an image. I just thought it was necessary to get proper exposure. That's it. And so a light like this did its job. The problem was I didn't really know what I was doing, so I didn't really put the lights in the right spot, and that really matters. Just really quickly here, I wanna tell you why this light is on the right side of the frame. It's because the window is over there. So it kind of tricks the eye, thinking that the light is coming from whatever direction the window's from. And then I realized something. I realized that I wanted softer lighting and I started watching YouTube videos for the first time about lighting and I found a tutorial about how to make a DIY light box and that's what I did. I can't overemphasize how big of a deal this was for me. Starting into lighting all started with this. Super cheap, kind of effective. The inside of the cardboard light box was covered with tin foil, so the light would reflect around the inside before going through the diffusion. There we go. Perfect. All right, let's see what we got. Crap. It's so much softer. Just this one simple change has made a huge difference. I used this light on the first little short film that I ever made, and I actually won a little cinematography award for my work on that. This was a big push for me to realize that I could do cinematography. Unfortunately, at this time in my mind, I thought that this setup looked so stupid that I really wanted to be legitimate. So I bought some lights, some used lights that they used on real movies. I bought four of these lights and started using them all over the place. And the reason why I liked them was because they looked professional. Not that the lighting looked professional, the light looked professional. And I'm gonna tell you what, this was a step backwards for me. Why was I thinking about the way the gear looked? It's all about the final image, remember that. So this is what you do with this kind of light. You put this paper diffusion on it to soften it. <laughs> There's a distinct difference between this and our light bulbs. See, those were daylight balanced. This is tungsten. All right, Lynn, how's this uh, light feel? Soft? Uh, no, it's pretty blinding. I would use two of these. One is the key light and one is the backlight. <laughs> but then we started realizing that the lights were too hot. We moved away from these fairly quickly. The next stage was fluorescent lighting. And this is it, quite expensive. And I saw on a lot of film sets at the time, people were using these. So I thought, okay, well, that's pretty cool. Check it out. These fluorescent bulbs get very, very bright. And this whole thing becomes essentially 
a soft source. Also, you're able to change out these fluorescent bulbs for tungsten or daylight. This cool piece of diffusion came with this light, and so we would put it on the front of the light to make it softer. I was very happy at the time with this look. I would have stayed with this as my favorite light if it weren't for LED lighting. Around this time, they started coming out. Although they weren't very big and they weren't very bright, they took very little power and they were pretty cheap and lightweight and very portable. Next, we used one by one LED panels. And what was great about this kit was we could travel with it, they were lightweight, they could take batteries, so we didn't have to use cables, and we were able to shoot faster. They did come with some downsides though. The light quality was a little bit green or sometimes magenta. This is when our three-point lighting stage started. Here it is. Just kidding. This is not the one-by-one -one LED panel we used to use. This is an Aperture Nova. And we've covered it with some black wrap to simulate the size and the rough position that we would use these LED panels with. And I have this at 5% brightness. This is about how bright it was. And I have a little bit of a green shift on this light to simulate the way the light looks. And this is all from memory. Does this look about right, James? Yeah, we're close. The light on the other side of the face um, would have been set half as bright. So one side of the face was brighter than the other. In the background, you can't forget that special backlight. This was fairly soft light, and for the time, we thought this looked pretty good. We used these lights on a lot of client videos, and this is when we started making a lot of corporate videos. We needed to go fast, we needed to look professional, and this standard three-point lighting became a staple for us when we filmed interviews. Unfortunately, these lights just weren't bright enough for a lot of situations. And then a miracle happened, the Aperture 120D. This is it. And we loved this because it was extremely bright. Sorry, Lynn. This is so bright, but it's not hot. This photography Bowens mount really changed the game. I thought it was a very smart idea, making a pretty soft source and it looked good. This simple one stand soft source was bigger than anything we had ever used before. The color difference between this and our one by one panel LED lights was huge. This had clean, beautiful colors that just seemed to pop. The fact that this light was so bright meant that we could shoot with windows and daylight, and it really changed the way we approached lighting. I've gotta say that at this time, this was an emotional hit for me. I was kind of embarrassed by this light. It looked like a photography light, and I'm not a photographer, and I didn't want people to think that I didn't know what I was doing. I wanted people to think that I was a filmmaker, but I soon got over that and was totally fine with this system because of how good it looked. Next, our lighting was doubled with the release of the Aperture 300D. The ballast power control situation was frankly an absolute nightmare. Shoot, this beautiful hot rod was then released. The care that was put into this light just it made me want to cry. What really changed around this time were the lighting modifier options that were available on the market. We discovered these, the Fresnel. This attachment changed these COB lights to be more like Hollywood lights, like an HMI. The spotlight mount was introduced so that we could create textures and different lighting effects using gobos and making slashes of light. In fact, let's go outside right now and I'm gonna use this light with this setup with Lynn and I'm gonna show you how with this light, we mimicked the power of the sun. Putting this outside and shining it through windows now became a reality. Because of this attachment and the intensity of this light, we were able to achieve a whole new look 
and I started to feel like a Hollywood DP or something. This is when we started our beauty lighting phase, and the most important thing was to make the subject look as beautiful as possible. We still used our three-point lighting ideas, but instead of using multiple light sources, we really started using bounces. Specifically, a white bounce like this. And by putting it on the side of the face, opposite of the key light, it made the key light appear a little bit softer. This specific LED tube from Amaran was not available during this time, but we had similar ones from different companies. And all of these lights together really became our formula for a number of years. Now the world has changed and these lighting companies are making extremely bright LED sources and they're just getting brighter. Aperture released the 600D and the 1200D, the brightest light yet that we have ever used. The 1200D specifically has completely changed our approach to lighting. Brighter lights now allow us to have different lighting methods. We can now have this big, large source that's filling the room with soft light and our perspective of lighting has changed over the years. We're trying to strive for a little bit more realism now and keeping that in mind. I will say, however, that my personal style is kind of like Lord of the Rings, where it's really over the top and a little bit too much backlight, a little bit too pretty. There are trends in filmmaking right now that say this needs to be real, it needs to be gritty, it needs to be dark. Just use one light source. I like to make things a little bit flashier. Let me talk through our setup here. We have a four by eight ultra bounce and our 1200D is shining into this, creating a soft, big source that's then being softened even more with this magic cloth. This is making such a big, soft source. To make the image more dynamic, we're actually using this negative fill instead of a bounce on the other side of her face and the light still appears soft. This is something we had a hard time doing with soft boxes. To, to use this method with negative fill, you actually have to have a lot of soft light as the key. Moving on towards the back here, we have the same backlight, but I've positioned it over here on the same side as the window for the sake of realism. Pretending like the backlight is coming from the window and hitting her from that same side. We have our 300D out the window, giving us this nice texture, making it seem like it's sunset. We've amplified the light a little bit more by adding this four foot tube from Amaran uh, coming off, kind of filling the kitchen with a little bit more light from this direction. And the reason why we put it here is because we want it to seem natural because that's where the light's coming from, from the side of the window. Right here we have a spotlight with the 600D. What this is doing is it's giving us a little slash of light against the background, kind of like it's coming from the window. It's not super realistic. It helps us because the dark side of Lynn's face can be accentuated and we can create kind of a checkerboard effect with this lighter section on the wall behind her. In this back room we have a 300D kind of shining on the back wall just to make it so it's not totally dark uh, because that room was really falling into darkness. And then something I learned from Shane Hurlbut recently is to use kind of a soft bluish greenish cyan type light to fill in the shadow areas in a scene. And it can kind of create a, a kind of a different feel in the midtones in the background. A lot of these techniques are not popular right now. And I wanna like let you guys know that I know that. And I think a lot of times as filmmakers, we fall into trends too much. We're trying to do what's popular, we're trying to fit in, we're trying to light the way everybody else is. And I don't think we need to do that. I think we can have our own style and do things our own way. And if your work looks like everyone else's, it's not gonna stand out, quite frankly. Now, currently, 
my philosophy about lighting is kind of shifting, I've got to say. And all of this gear here, I'm kind of realizing is kind of superfluous and it can kind of get in the way of the creative experience, the amount of angles that we can get. When you're moving around all this gear all day from place to place, it gets tiring. And so my new philosophy is work smarter, not harder. Uh, why set up all this gear when you don't have to? Check this out. Crap. All I have to do is open this darn window. Sometimes you just need to have someone sit by a window. I think my new way of approaching things is to do less lights and to worry more about the story. If you enjoyed watching this video and you want to subscribe to our channel, please don't. Epic Light Media does not need any more subscribers. However, there is a YouTuber on YouTube with a channel called Lewis Potts. And the creator of that channel, his name, is Lewis Potts and he lives in Australia. He's an extremely talented director of photography with a lot to say. And if you watch his channel, you'll actually learn a ton. So go ahead, subscribe to him and don't watch our channel ever again.